Greetings, and welcome to my newest video in the Herald Saga. This is meant to be a film review and historical commentary on this 2017 film, which is, dare I say it, one of the best films to come out of Germany in the past years. I felt that this historical commentary is necessary because for many people, including yours truly, the captain was the first encounter with Harold's story, and since there aren't that many sources on him in English, there is a tendency to regard the film as historically accurate, when in reality it has some glaring historical inaccuracies, which in my opinion distort Harold's story and his motivations. Fair warning, there will be massive spoilers throughout this video. We first meet our protagonist in April 1945, two weeks before the end of the war, a deserter running away from his Wehrmacht pursuers. And this is where the historical accuracy already kisses us goodbye and hops on the train. Harold did not start off as a deserter, nor was he ever pursued by the Wehrmacht. His unit, the combat group Gramse, was chased out of the Netherlands and he simply lost contact with them in the chaos on the field. It was not an uncommon occurrence. The countryside was full of wandering soldiers who were looking for their units or hoping to come across some Wehrmacht checkpoint so they could be assigned to new units. By portraying Harold as a deserter, Robert Schwenke paints him as a coward, and Willy Harold was many things, but a coward he was not. In fact, I dare say that if he had been more of a coward, a great deal of people, including himself, would have been a great deal safer. His fatal flaw was the exact opposite. It was his recklessness. Harold is trying to patch up the rags that were once his uniform when he meets with what appears to be another deserter and has a moment of kindness when he brings him to shelter. Never happened. I really like their non-verbal communication though. You can see everything they want to say on their faces. And for all it's worth, the film does a great job at portraying the desperation that these men must have felt, wandering around in the cold, desperately trying to stay alive for one more day, fearing that any moment now, some patrol will snatch them and put them up against a wall. We see what happens to thieves. This was accurate. As rationing became more strict during the end of the war, Germany was desperate to discourage people from stealing, and thieves had to sometimes pay with their lives for any kind of theft, whether it be stealing a bit of soap during an air raid or basket of eggs. In fact, there was one prisoner in the prison camp Aschendorfermoor who ended up being there because he had stolen some linen for his wife. Harold loses his companion in an attempt to steal food and escapes. Then we come across one of the most iconic scenes in the film, when Harold makes a life-changing discovery. The timeline is a bit off here, since the real Harold found the uniform at the end of March 1945, probably the 30th, very likely on the same day after getting lost from his unit, and not in April. I love Mark Subaha in this scene. He said in an interview that Harold is somewhat of a jester, and I don't think he was wrong. The real Harold was a young man full of imagination, very observant and very funny, and in consequence he was very good at entertaining. The smoldering folders are there to suggest desertion. It's most likely true. The captain whose uniform Harold claims as his own probably did desert, unlike Harold. There's a fascinating butterfly effect at play in Harold's story, both the real one and in the film. An act of cowardice by an officer which would end up with hundreds of people dead and many more traumatized, not just in Germany but in Britain too. More on that later. Harold meets Freitag, who in the film is in his 40s, but in reality was only 22, and he's at first unsure of how to react, but Freitag does all the work for him and just chatters away. Here Freitag introduces himself as a Gefreiter, a lance corporal, but in reality he was an Obergefreiter, a corporal, so ironically he outranked Harold. In reality, Harold meets Freitag, who is with another soldier, on the 31st of March. And just like him, the two have become separated from the unit, and unlike in the film, the real Harold had already mastered the identity of the captain, and he rebukes the two for not saluting him properly, after which he asks to see their paybooks. And after being satisfied that they were not deserters, which is another difference to the film, where it's clear that Freitag is a deserter and Harold plays along out of sympathy, Harold tells them to make haste and rejoin the unit. It's only on April 1st that Harold meets Freitag again at the Wehrmacht checkpoint and convinces the superior officer there to assign Freitag and four others to his unit. Oh, and one more thing. His name was not Walter Freitag, it was Reinhard Freitag. 
Schwenke's inspiration for this scene was clearly the opening scene in Theodore Panchev's book, The Emsland Executioner, where Panchev imagines Harold finding the uniform and meeting Freitag this way and gives Freitag's first name incorrectly. Panchev got Freitag's name wrong because in the official case documents, there is an affidavit by a prisoner called Walter Freitag, who was a prisoner at the camp and had nothing to do with Reinhard Freitag. And Panchev just confused the two. But this scene served as sort of literary introduction and it has little to do with what really happened. We can see in this scene that Harold comes to the realization that masquerading as a captain might not actually be such a bad idea. The real Harold wore the uniform with two clear purposes. The first one was to form a competent combat squad and stop or at least slow down the enemy. Harold still believed that Germany could turn the tide around. And his future military behavior proved that. We'll soon talk about how he put his money where his mouth is. The second purpose was covering himself in glory. Harold was very ambitious and supremely self-confident and wanted to be a leader ever since he was a child. His whole life, he had thought to place himself at the top of whatever hierarchy he found himself in and loved ordering people around. Historian Paul Meyer suggests that Harold was frustrated because although he had volunteered for the Wehrmacht and fought in two of the bloodiest battles in 1944, he was still a lance corporal. Harold, a pathological glory hound, was convinced that if he was in charge, he could make a significant difference in the fight against the enemy. And he probably hoped he cut himself a shortcut to some medals or a promotion with this type of desperado action. So we have a clear difference between film Harold, who slowly and uncertainly slides into the role of the captain, and the real Harold, who wanted a promotion, a position of power with every fibre of his being, and who, fun fact, had actually committed stolen valour the year before, when he passed himself off as a non-commissioned officer during his leave home. There's another small detail in Harold's and Freitag's initial interaction in the film. Harold addresses Freitag with the polite and respectful Z. The real Harold, during his stint as a captain, addressed everybody he met with the informal Du. It's a subtle but noticeable power play. And so they drive off. In reality, the vehicle was beyond repair and had to be abandoned, and Harold eventually procures bicycles for himself and his troops. Robert Schwenke empties Harold of his personality and background, and leaves the setting of the film nameless. We only know that the film takes place in Germany, when in reality it took place in the region of Emsland. I think that he might have done so in order to suggest that this could have happened anywhere. His film is a metaphor for the corrupting influence of power. He's not very interested in binding the story to specific geographical coordinates. But in spite of that, he manages to dilute the essence of what really happened in brilliant scenes such as the one in the inn. In just a few seconds, you become aware of how poor the region is. At the time, Emsland was the poorest region in Germany, and the war naturally had made things worse. What attitude the people had via the Nazi party, the Emslanders hadn't voted overwhelmingly for the Nazis, and how skilled Harold was in adapting himself to every new situation he encountered. The way he starts with a subtle threat and then deflates the tension by asking how high the damages were is very clever, and although nothing like this really happened, it tells you everything you need to know about his personality. Mark Subacher does look a little bit like the real Harold. Fantastic casting choice. Harold's first test is the execution of a thief. It's shown as the first real stepping stone into darkness, as the whole thing is morally dubious. There's no real trial involved, nor does Harold ask the details about what the man was supposed to have stolen and why. It's also quite hypocritical of him that his execution of the man is shown as something he did to maintain his cover and to ultimately survive. This did not happen either. Harold didn't shoot anybody until he reached the prison camp, 11 days into his foray as a captain. The difference here is that the descent is very slow for film Harold. One compromise here, another there, and everything done in the name of survival, at least at first. But the real Willy Herold went from not killing absolutely anybody to ordering the massacre of almost a hundred men within a single day. The break was much more radical and sudden in reality. 
Oh, so the real Harold had no hesitations about killing. He was used to it, and it wasn't a big deal to him. There is absolutely no record of him showing any hesitation before shooting somebody, the way he does in the film. So in a way, the film humanizes Harold in ways in which he was really not. Freitag seems fairly morally conflicted in the thief's execution scene, but in reality, he was equally blasé about killing as his supposed captain. He was a short, weedy and brutal-looking young man who had an impressive war record, but had never been promoted above the rank of corporal because of his low IQ. He is a far cry from the gentle and morally conflicted Freitag we see in the film. The fact that Harold slept alone was accurate. His first concern was being discovered, so he hid his paybook in his boot and insisted on always having his own room, which wouldn't have looked suspicious to anybody as, a f as officers didn't usually bunk with the lower enlisted. It's true that Harold and Freitag would settle into a very comfortable, very close-knit leader-follower position with a sort of criminal complicity developing between the two of them. Harold was, however, not as polite or eager to pacify Freitag as in the film. He was quite all right, even charming, if you did absolutely everything he said and bow down to him, but he was a mercurial, unpredictable character and ultimately very cold-blooded. 24 minutes into the film, we have the title drop. Ah, Kipinski. Great casting choice as well. He, he was good-looking in reality. He spoke Polish better than German and had a large amount of gold teeth in his mouth. Kipinski is immediately positioned as a sort of friendly enemy to Harold and immediately realizes that Harold is a fraud by looking at his pants. In reality, there wasn't any conflict between Harold and Kipinski, and Harold's pants fit him well. It's his uniform jacket that was too wide in the back. Anyways, he agrees to join Harold, placing him in the uncomfortable position of having a snake in his unit. It didn't happen like this. But it's worth noting that the affidavits read at the trial hint at the fact that the real Harold might have been ruling from atop a fragile house of cards. There are clues that at least some of his men knew that Harold wasn't who he said he was. A former prisoner of Aschendorfer Moor, who had joined Harold's unit after the destruction of the camp, recalls how, while they were being held in a cell after the whole story was over, a different prisoner, by the name of Ulzak, claimed that he had seen Harold's paybook in the camp, giving his rank as a lance corporal. We don't know if he saw it by accident, while maybe carrying a drunken Harold to bed, or if Harold himself showed it to him. Ozak is also the first to be promoted by Harold to the rank of corporal. Was it an incentive to keep his mouth shut? In any case, Schwenke manages to sketch the delicate situation Harold found himself in as an imposter. In the film, it's clear that Kipinski's subordination is paper thin, and he drops off certain teasing hints to Harold that he's on to him. The real Harold would not have tolerated that. He was absolutely not conflict adverse and was very much temperamental, so Kipinski wouldn't have lasted a minute in Harold's unit with that attitude. Kipinski's appearance begins a small and almost unnoticeable series of war compromises for Harold. Notice how passive he was when Kipinski hit the farmer's wife. A good officer, or just a good person, would have immediately rebuked him, but Harold chooses to ignore it, probably because he bore a grudge against the farmer and his wife for killing his companion. It's significant that instead of stopping Kipinski, he goes to cover the body of the deserter. Also, the villagers of Emsland weren't taking the law that much into their hands. Thieves would be captured and handed over to the Wehrmacht or the local police or whatever, but they weren't killing people left and right on their own. 30 minutes into the film, we find out our protagonist's name. I think it would have been cool to give Hubacher a sample of Harold's handwriting so that it could be similar. Harold had a very distinctive way of writing the letter H. Harold gathers more men, acquires an anti-aircraft gun. In reality, he and his men had stumbled upon a lost group of parachutists who had a vehicle, and that's when he finally gets a car. In the 10 days before he reaches Aschendorf Moor, Harold makes genuine attempts to fight the enemy. And this is something that the film leaves out completely. He organizes scouting missions with enemy contact, mostly at night because of the enemy planes, 
and takes part in them personally. He fights the enemy head-on several times and mounts an attack against the occupied village of Lawton, fights side by side with his men, even getting injured as a result. Harold's military behavior is not that of a coward. He even mounts the attack against the Allies in Lawton against the advice of other Wehrmacht officers. They advise him not to do it, but he stubbornly goes on ahead. These attacks that he leads are ultimately rejected because the Allies have tanks and he becomes frustrated with this lack of weaponry and manpower. He's sure that if he had just more men and better weapons, he could stop the Allied advance. And it's this belief that drives him to Aschendorfermoor, because he had heard that there are thousands of former Wehrmacht soldiers languishing there, and he hopes to be able to take them and use them to fight the enemy. The encounter with the Captain Sichna is an amalgam of several encounters which Harold had managed to weasel out of. In this scene, there is a hint that these soldiers are up to no good, and that Captain Sichna agrees to let Harold go unchecked because he's afraid his misdeeds will be brought to light and he will be made responsible by the Wehrmacht. In my research, I haven't found any hints that what this captain was doing was off. He was fully within his right to identify the men as they stumbled into his check post. This is what a check post is supposed to do. You find a soldier there, you ask him to identify himself. It's a way to weed out deserters. In any case, the real Harold doesn't go with them. He goes on with his troop towards the north. I'm not sure who Captain Junkers is supposed to be based on. I think he might be a completely original character. He recognizes Harold from somewhere, but can't put his finger on where he knows him from. Fun fact, two different people, Lieutenant Heinz Müller and SS Untersturmführer Josef Urbanek, actually mistook Harold for someone else. And in the case of Urbanek, who confused him with the Luftwaffe captain he had met in France, leads to Harold's identity as a captain being further solidified, as Urbanek tells his boss, district leader Buscher, that he knew Harold from France. The constant drinking is also accurate. Wehrmacht officers and prison officials alike were hitting the bottle pretty hard. Harold himself was quite fond of alcohol too. The real Harold was far more confident and cocky than Hubacher's visibly uncertain Harold. He looked and acted like the real deal. He was a position that he had wanted and practiced for all his life. He was enjoying it profoundly. Here we have Harold's motivation as survival. He agrees to shoot the prisoners because he feels that submerging himself in this identity would insulate him from being discovered and killed. In reality, however, Harold agrees to kill the men for two reasons. To keep those prisoners who were political prisoners out of the enemy's hands and to placate Schutter by getting rid of those prisoners who had attempted to escape. Only then will Harold be allowed to get the prisoners he wants to use to fight the enemy. So he saw these massacres as a sort of twisted side quests before he could unlock his main quest and progress his story further. The scene is fairly accurate and beautifully played. In just a few minutes you get a detailed and historically accurate description of the situation. I really like how Harold asked Captain Junkers if he remembered where they knew each other from after all. It's such an unnecessary risk. And this is exactly the kind of risk the real Harold was constantly taking. He was saying things like he belonged to the 6th Parachutist Division, which was risky because they were nearby. Somebody could have made inquiries. He was telling people that he had orders from the Fuhrer himself. Crazy stuff. But he was also enormously lucky because people believed him. All it would have taken was for one person to really insist that he shows his papers and it would have been all over for him. While the real Kipinski did indulge his worst impulses in the camp, the real Harold was not as passive as film Harold and neither was Freitag. In fact, Freitag was one of the cruelest and most violent men under Harold's command. The abuse that the prisoners suffer at the hands of Harold's men is depressingly accurate. I'm going to skip most of it because that's all we really need to know. So Schutter goes to get the camp supervisor, Friedrich Hansen. Hansen's characterization is spot on. He's a complete bureaucrat and he's absolutely right. 
The SA serves only to guard the camp and the prisoners when they are out on work missions. But the part where he's exploiting the daughter of a prisoner so her father could get a winter coat is new to me. In all my research, I haven't come across any reports that Hansen was up to anything like that. It could be that the film wants to turn him into the prototype of the prison official, make a figurehead out of him. Small side. Schutter actually had his arm in a sling at the time of Harold's visit to Aschendorf or more. Hansen tries to reach Dr. Thiel in Pappenburg. I love how Harold unexpectedly yoinks Schutter into the pot by essentially forcing him to lie that the prisoners attacked Harold. This was Bernd Hirscher's first role and he acts wonderfully. He's a melting pot of barely suppressed excitement, eagerness and uncertainty. There's a bit of here and there going on between the camp and Poppenburg, where Harold and Schutte actually drive around trying to convince officials to give them the green light for the executions. And I fully understand why this was left out. It would have been tedious. This scene is psychotically hilarious. The rivalry between Hansen and Schutte reaches kindergarten proportions. Where did Harold get his coat? He didn't have it in the beginning. This is supposed to be Heinz Hofmeister. The real Hofmeister was in his 40s and was a sergeant. He was the only one who knew how to man the anti-aircraft gun and this is the reason why he asked his superior officer to allow him to join Harold's troop. It's he who was assigned by Harold to be his NCO since he outranked all the other men. The way the men are positioned shows that this was inspired from Harold's second massacre of the prisoners marked for desertion. Harold hated deserters. As I said before, he did not start as one. Of course, one can argue that Harold becomes a deserter when he puts on the uniform, as he deserts from his position of lance corporal, the only legitimate role he had within the Wehrmacht. But Harold did not see himself as a deserter, since he continued to fight the enemy and operate within a military framework. And the Germans do charge him with desertion later, but this is one of the charges which his lawyer can successfully fight against, according to Harold himself, so grain of salt. The massacres were even worse than it happened in the film. Men were crying for their parents, howling in pain. They had the most gruesome injuries. Some who were still alive were hit by shovels or even buried alive because nobody bothered to check whether they were truly dead before burying them. Freitag is absolutely not passive during this massacre. He's a very willing and very active participant. He empties pistol after pistol into the victims. Okay, we need to talk about this guy right here. His name was Hans Stalle Kaufmann and he was absolutely fantastic. He was 37 years old and a convinced anti-Nazi and this got him sentenced to death in 1944 although his punishment was later commuted to five years in a prison camp. He was sent to the prison camp Esterwegen, where he suffered under the brutality of the prison guards and the miserable conditions in the camp. On the 10th of April 1945, because the situation in Germany was becoming desperate, he was released and sent to join the Volkssturm, and he was given a bunch of former prisoners and farmers to command. The men were uninterested in fighting and poorly equipped, and so when Dalek Kaufmann reaches Camp 2 on the 13th of April and learns of Harold's presence there, he wants to tell him that he can't fight with the ragtag group of men he was given. And that's when he stumbles upon the scene of the massacre. He witnesses all this horror and he could have kept his head down and thanked his lucky stars that he was no longer a prisoner and had a chance at an honorable discharge. But he doesn't. He faces this officer who outranks him and tells him point blank that he's a murderer and that he's going to report him. This man has barely stepped out of a prison camp and already proved that they didn't break it. Harold defiantly pointed to his own car as if to say, oh, you want to report me? Go ahead, take my car, you'll get there faster. Truculent and insufferable and threatens to have him shot with the next group of prisoners. Realizing that Harold is unhinged, Hans Stella Kaufmann retreats to what he thought was a safe distance and photographs the next massacre, because among the personal effects that were returned to him upon his release was the Leica camera. So he takes photographic evidence of the massacre. This was risky, as somebody could have seen him and reported him to Harold. 
unfortunately, the footage will be destroyed by a Canadian soldier. This really happened. The prisoners tasked with filling up the mass grave refused, so these dolts had to do it themselves. Harold asks Schutte to organize a party. Schutte and his wife act all gooey, and this is accurate. When Schutte was sentenced to death as a result of the role he played in the massacres, his wife Doris tried every recourse to save him, and in her plea she wrote, and I quote, For 25 years I have been living in an extremely happy matrimony with my husband, and all of us have thought him to be the ideal affectionate father of his family, for whom the welfare of his family was the highest aim of his life and who as an honest and good-natured man enjoyed the esteem of his fellow men. It is inconceivable that I should lose my dearly beloved husband. Through his death, my own life and that of our daughter will lose all meaning. I've always been mystified by the ability of men like Schutte to put together the bloodthirsty, violent man and the affectionate husband and father under the same roof. I suspect the poisonous Nazi regime made it easier to dehumanize fellow human beings. But it's still a rather hair-raising, isn't it? How do you carry this much bloodlust and cruelty inside your mind and then manage to function as a normal human being? Fun fact, the real shooter was indeed a musician. Harold notices that Freitag isn't having a lot of fun at the party. I think the whole reason why Schwenke decided to make Freitag the moral compass of the team, in spite of the real guy being such an unlikely candidate for this position, is because of two incidents related to Freitag. The first one happened a week after the first massacres, when Freitag went to Harold and told him that he could not go on with the shootings anymore because he was on the verge of a mental breakdown. As brutal and merciless as Freitag was, he encountered a problem that many of the Germans in the death squads had struggled with. There's one thing to kill a soldier in what could be deemed a fair fight, a kill or be killed moment. But there's quite another thing to kill defenseless people. No matter how much you try to dehumanize them, at one point it just gets to you and it's harder and harder to look at yourself and still think you are anything but a monster. Harold told him that he's free to go to the front, but Freitag's survival instinct wins, and he stays with his captain. The second incident happens when Harold is arrested. Freitag was with him at that moment, and when he found out that Harold was not a real captain, he had a mental breakdown and began crying like a child. After finishing recounting this to the British intelligence officer who was questioning him, Harold straightened up his shoulders and added a line which was very enlightening of his personality. He said, Freitag was a milksop. Harold was so entrenched in the Nazi ideal of what a real man looks like and behaves and reacts that he saw Freitag's total breakdown at the thought of having followed all these difficult orders for someone who tricked him as weakness. And this is where I'm going to stop for today because otherwise I'm going to hit the one hour mark again. In the next part of my review, I'm going to cover the second half of the film and give my final thoughts on the topics of historical accuracy and the overall value of this film. Until then, take care.